Hello, everyone. I'm Jean-Claude Abion Mystic, and welcome to this very special episode. Today's title is Nostradamus and the Vortex of Time. With me today are two very distinguished guests. You can find the first one here, Jay Widener at Reality Check here on YouTube and also on his website at jwidener.com. Jay, welcome back to the show. How are you? It's great to be back. Thank you. Excited to have you on. And folks, of course, the amazing Julie from Maison Jupiter here on YouTube and also on the web at MaisonJupiter.com. Julie. Welcome back to the show. Hey, everybody. Hello, you too. Nice to be here. <laughs> I'm so excited. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here on this live interactive show. We're going to have a wonderful conversation today about how all of this seems to be tying in together. We're going to go in the past and look at some of those Nostradamus prophecies. We're going to look at some of these uh, other predictions, including the one from Ro um, Rudolf Steiner. And we're going to also be looking at this context and the setup here in the astrology for the fall which is the saturn uranus square so that ultimate battle here between the piscean and the aquarian age all this in one episode so thank you guys i will be bringing your comments on uh, during the show and if we have time we'll try to get some tech uh, some questions here added up uh, to the end of the show jay before i start the last time you were here we had a wonderful conversation about your amazing book here the mysteries of the great cross of hende can you, for the audience members who might not have seen that show that was on my previous YouTube that was deleted, kind of remind them how some of the um, archaeology and some of the architecture in the uh, Falconelli's book here, Le Ministère de Cathédrale, was referring to this cyclic cataclysm here on the planet and what the elites do at the end of those cycles. Let's start there, Jay. <clears throat> well, basically, uh, Falconelli wrote a book. It came out in 1926 called Mystery of the cathedrals it caused a big stir in the alchemical circles of, of France. Uh, there was only 300 copies made, so it was a very rare book. But in the 50s, they decided, because we now could print paperbacks and stuff, they brought it back out, but it had an additional chapter, which the original didn't have. <clears throat> and that chapter is a, a, on the cyclic cross of Hende or Undai, or whatever. I just do it, I pronounce it in the English way because I don't want to confuse anybody. But um, uh, so anyway, this uh, cross, Fulcanelli tells us, is about the end of time. And if you um, translate the cross correctly, the symbols on the cross, you will understand in great detail about the nature of the cataclysm at the end of time. So I got really involved in that. And starting in 1986, I spent decades literally tracing down every everything uh, about it and uh, reading everything and talking to people. And uh, basically, the cyclic cross of Hende is saying that at the end of the um, <clears throat> great year, the 25,920-year cycle, we have an explosion from the sun. A gigantic solar flare, CME, that causes gigantic plasma strikes here on Earth um, that wreaks havoc and kills nearly everything on the planet. And um, and this is a normal event. It happens all the time. It's talked about in the uh, the Vedic texts talk about it, openly talk about it. Um, the uh, Aztecs did their uh, sacrifices to satisfy the sun from not getting angry because it got angry the last time. And um, and so what I believe is that there, but the cross is describing what is a double catastrophe. So what happened the last time this happened, which is a little over 12,000 years ago, there we got we got a double we got hit a double whammy. First we had a gigantic comet come in, break up into four gigantic pieces first, and then into hundreds of pieces and hit Canada and North America, creating all the lakes, by the way, that are in Canada. And um, <clears throat> that caused a nuclear winter, which threw us into the Younger Dryas, a 1,200-year-long freeze-out that nearly killed everything on Earth, uh, especially anything north of 20 degrees because mercilessly cold. And... Um, and then the solar flare happened uh, 1,200 years after the comet, which is the second part of the catastrophe, <clears throat> and that melted all the ice that was created in the Younger Dryas. And that and, and almost instantly melted all the ice. Not It, it happened really fast. And so uh, if you know the work of Randall Carlson, gigantic streams of water came down through Canada, down through Washington State and the Columbia River. And, I mean, we're talking 
five times bigger than the Amazon River, that much water. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and all over North America, you can see the traces of this uh, uh, double catastrophe. And so, um, you know, when does it happen? Well, you know, even Jesus said, no man, no man will know when this thing will happen. So I don't know when it will happen. But I can tell you this, the elites are preparing for it and have been preparing for it ever since 1957 when the book came out. And we know that Fulconelli was chased all around uh, France by the OSS, the precursors to the FBI, and because he had nuclear secrets. And um, uh, and all alchemists have nuclear secrets. That's what's all part of the game. And so, uh, you know, he, he was on the run, and he finally, I think, probably escaped to South America uh, in the 30s to get away from all the scrutiny. And, uh, you know, because he alchemists go to jail. This is what, what happens. I mean, you, know, you can go, history is replete with uh, uh, alchemists accidentally telling someone that they know something and then the king arrests them because they want to get it. And then you never hear of them again, right? And You're often in the king's favor until they're not, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and then yes. they get a quick visit to uh, the dungeon. Okay, let me bring that up here, folks. If you guys are looking for the mysteries of the uh, cathedrals here by Falconelli, this is one of the versions here you can find on paperback on Amazon. Really, really interesting read. I have the French version of that too, Le Mystère des Cathédrales. Uh, you'll see the blue cover if you're looking for that. And of course, Jay Widener's right. book here is uh, The Mysteries of the Great Cross of Hende. Uh, the alchemy and the end of time. So, Jay, specifically on this end of time thing here, what you're saying here is that the elites, of course, know this. We are obfuscated from a lot of this occult uh, data. But bring it back also. You mentioned the Incas earlier, but I want you to go even further into some of these yugas. Again, for the audience members who might not have heard our previous show on this, explain how... Um, there are secret societies here on the planet who understand this very well and plan for these different cycles. And we're at one of those critical junctures here. And what also the elites usually do during this critical juncture, that will set the stage also for the rest of the conversation here today. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> if you, if you know, your like alternative archeology span history, you know that, uh, particularly the French are uh, funding uh, guys going all over the world looking for stuff, right? And Germans too, but particularly French. Um, and um, I, they're part of a project, I call it Project X. And it started, I believe, at least with Napoleon. Uh, I believe that's when Project X started his uh, trip to Egypt, began a uh, funding of an occult secret underground research group that is looking into everything. Mm -hmm. And I believe that they are obsessed with this idea of the end of the world and the uh, end of the Iron Age and keeping themselves alive during it. But one thing I can tell you, have, because of my interest in alchemy, I, I have gotten to meet a lot of very wealthy people. They want to know my secrets, you know, or whatever. And I don't have any secrets. So um, they, uh, uh, so I meet them. And I can tell you, the one thing that they're more interested in than anything, besides making money, is keeping alive, staying alive. They spend tons and tons of their money, especially when they get in their 60s and 70s, staying alive, basically. And, 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 and dreaming of living to be 120 and 130 or even beyond that. And maybe some of them achieve it. I know that the people on Silicon Valley are spending billions of dollars right now in life extension. So that's a big thing. So what they want to do is survive the coming catastrophe. In the Vedic texts, they clearly say that, and there's no doubt, it clearly says that at the end of the last Kali Yuga, right before Brahma exploded the sun, they built giant arcs and went to a planet called Mahar, M-A-H-A-R, Mahar. And they uh, went underground on Mahar and they waited it, waited it out until the earth had uh, everything was burned up on the earth. And then they brought back all the um, genetic material, the seeds, all the stuff that they had saved. That's why Gates has his seed bank up in Norway. That's mm -hmm. what they're doing. If you look at every single thing they're doing, you'll understand that this is what they're doing. 
Mm -hmm. they're taking all the precautions. Uh, the deep underground military bases started building right after Fulcanelli's book came out in the 50s. Um, they also began uh, the secret space program uh, in the 50s. Uh, and again, what's the secret space program? It's a way to get off the planet in secret. Uh, well, why would you want to do that? Well, I don't know. I guess because they think there's a catastrophe coming. Mm -hmm. And so the, what they're doing right now is they're they're trying to create a uh, a uh, um, a type a type three civilization here on Earth. They're trying to create a type two, so we are a type three. They're trying to create a type two civilization, and they're trying to uh, synthesize everything on the planet, and 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 everything is going to be under their control. Your thermostat, your calorie intake, how much gas you burn, uh, everything. This is the plan. The plan is to put everything under the auspices of this. Of, of their control uh, so that they can move whenever they want to move without us hindering them. And right. um, this is what, uh, uh, you know, what's his name? Elon Musk is always talking about going to, going to Mars, right? I think Mahar is Mars. I think mm -hmm. that Mars is the escape hatch for the elites. And they go there and they, they, they were probably dark skinned when they left, whenever this was the last time and they lost all their pigment uh, and they, and, you know, and they uh, came back and and they started uh, uh, creating a civilization back on Earth again. And uh, all of this pr happened, you know, uh, like 10,000 years ago or so. I believe that's mm -hmm. when they came back uh, after the last catastrophe. And, um, and, and it's a periodic thing. It mm -hmm. happens over and over and over and over. And they know it. They're very much more advanced than we are. The older I get, and the more I study these guys, the more I realize that they're, they they understand astrology better than any astrologer I've ever known. They understand um, uh, uh, history better than anybody I ever know. I'm talking about the very top elite people, the, the very top of the Masonic orders. Uh, in the world. These guys are very, very advanced and they're women too. And they're very advanced. They have incredible parapsychological powers and, and the ability to influence whole societies uh, using just their thought forms. And um, they may even have their own country somewhere out in the South Pacific or something where that is not on the maps so that they can, you know, get away from all of us. I don't know, but, I, you know, I, I entertain these things in the past, but now I no longer entertain them. I now think that actually we are living on a planet with people who may be three or 400 years old and they live here among us. Mm -hmm. There seems to be evidence of that. Also, if you look at, I'm going to bring this up also for another reason here, but uh, Anatoly Fomenko's, <clears throat> this series of books here talks about uh, perhaps a manipulation in our timelines and that's very interesting for the conversation today of course we're going to look at the vortex of time here with some of the nostradamus stuff but going back to this yuga age for a lot of us preparing here and for the elites is it possible that if you look at that fomenko work that the timelines have been manipulated in our view for the plebeians for the normals so that we don't know exactly when these particular changes are happening what are your thoughts on that jay Bingo. Exactly right. 100%. That's what they're doing. And they mess with the timeline. So we think we're in one time period, but actually we're a thousand years uh, further back. Um, it's, there's a the great mystery, of course, is, um, is that if you take, if you go to the year 400 AD, right, and you look at the ships, the weapons, the building materials, how things were built, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then you go to 1400 AD, a thousand years later, the ships are exactly the same. The weapons are exactly the same. The building, way you build buildings is exactly the same. There's no advancements on anything on any level from 400 to 1400. It's impossible. It's just, that's not possible. I don't know what, what, what the truth of the matter is. I, I'm looking into it. There's all sorts of uh, hidden possibilities. I think I said on your show before, I have a, a book in my library, a uh, magazine from 1859, uh, American Archaeology magazine. And it says right there, there's an article in that magazine that says that in 1859, that there were temples that uh, rivaled Abydos here in, in America. There were gigantic structures and, and all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff was here long before the Europeans ever arrived. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's very possible that a super advanced 
civilization, like say the Phoenicians, came here and made friends with the Native Americans and built settlements and uh, cities. And uh, when the Europeans arrived, they just stumbled onto them, pretty much. And 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 even even um, even Quebec, uh, where you guys are, where, where you guys live, Quebec has a strange and odd history and. And the uh, the Great Fire and the whole oh, yeah. thing is just I don't know it's a, yeah. it's a big mystery and I'm going to uncover it you know maybe I'll start studying my Nostradamus again see if he left a clue. Well, there's clues in that, and we're starting this series also here on Nostradamus on the show. And we're not sure we're going to be able to do all of them here on YouTube because of some of the weird censorship going on. Uh, and on that note, guys, uh, while we're here, can you please uh, go over to Reality Check here on YouTube and uh, give Jay here a like and a subscribe also. We're trying to bump up these numbers also for him. Please. So it's got amazing content there. So please do uh, go and check it out. And while you're at it, also uh, move on over here to Maison Jupiter where Julie is also producing some really really cool astrological content uh, there as well uh kimberly was asking hey can you repost that book so yes there's three things we're talking about here so let me just do that and guys just take a quick uh, screen grab if you want mysteries of the cathedrals was the first one uh jay's book here the mysteries of the great cross of hende and the last one was the uh, fomenko series let me see if i can have that back on the screen for you guys here uh this here is what you're looking for julie uh thank you for bearing with us and all of this you've been studying here in in the last um, number of years, the astrology, but just recently you've been guided uh, by source mm -hmm. here to explore Nostradamus. And what was interesting, just a little while ago, Naughty Beaver, who who's another Canadian uh, content producer, picked up this old reading uh, that Janine Morijo had done, uh, basically channeling Nostradamus here a couple of years ago and reposted a few things and see how all of this is timing into our landscape right now. And you were guided to pick up a book Explain that to the audience and why we're doing the show today. And then we'll get into two specific car trains that we want to see if we can tie in both uh, with the Great Cross of Hende, but also Jay's wide, wide, wide um, experience and knowledge and all things occult. Julie, how did you get started on this? Yeah, so that's an interesting story. Um, I was I picked a card, an Oracle card, and it said to open up a book and that that book would have the answer I'm seeking. And I kind of forgot about it. And then the next day, I felt guided to open up a book that I've never opened up before. And it was that book, The Nostradamus by John Hogg. And it's a pretty big book, as you can see, that was gifted to me by my sister. But at the time I, I received it, I was like, Nostradamus, OK, thank you. But I, like, I didn't express any particular interest in Nostradamus before that. So. Uh, so I heard his name a couple of times in a few days. So I was like, uh, okay, let me open that book. And I felt guided to open up towards a specific page and a specific uh, area on the page. So I didn't know much about him at that time. So uh, I was guided to a particular quadrant that we'll um, reveal in just a bit. And, and then I was like, JC, do you know something about that? <laughs> Because usually when I have something I'm wondering about, like JC has a lot of explanations for me that I it, it's it spares some time of research. So I I asked him, and he was like, "Well, actually, uh, Naughty Beaver did, did a decode on that pretty recently, I believe." So I watched a video with Janine, and I and then I learned he was talking a lot about astrology and. So it was like a big uh, revelation to start looking into it. So I felt. And let me just say, and let me just say here too. Also, when Janine did her uh, reading, uh, channeling Nostradamus in this particular video, she also repeated something, and she knew nothing about this at the time. Somebody else was prompting her all these questions, uh, but she was also repeating something that Dolores Cannon had said that some of these Nostradamus prophecies were not meant yet to be decoded, and that mm. they would be decoded in the future, probably by somebody with knowledge. Of astrology <laughs> so here comes uh, julie our amazing astrologer so julie let's talk about this particular um quatrain here the first one and let's yeah that so up that's for the you. one i was uh, guided towards and i didn't know it was like a a, a pretty well-known quatrain uh so yeah so keep in mind that it's it was written in french and there is a couple different translations in english so uh, sometimes the words are not that precise, but it says the world near the final period, Saturn again will make a late return. 
the empire is transferred towards the broad nation, the eye plucked out at Narbonne by a hawk. So it kind of struck a chord because uh, the first, if you can go back to, we're having yep. a bit of it. Let me just mute. Okay, thanks. <laughs> if we go back to it, when I first read the, the first line, the world near the final period, I immediately, immediately thought about this Saturn Uranus square that we're having at the moment, which is the last square of the whole cycle between Saturn and Uranus. And for me, it represents globalism, this will to centralize everything. And also it has to do with what Jay was saying earlier, this digital ID that we're, they're trying to move us into and to control uh, our energy, our um, consumption, everything about us, but also our identity. So uh, I was thinking about this final square, so it kind of uh, brought me back to it. And um, at, the, at the present moment, we're experiencing a very strong influence of that last Saturn Uranus square, and it's going to be almost exact on October 4th, uh, and it's the last time we're going to feel this uh, square that heavy. And uh, well, basically for people that don't really know much about it, it's pretty much a clash between the old world and the new world. Saturn mm -hmm. being the planet that represents the old world or uh, the ruling powers. Uh, and then we'll, we're gonna talk about it later too, but it's, it also represents time, be, being bound to time, Saturn. Yeah. So the clash between old world and new world, Uranus representing this like rebel alliance uh, type of energy, uh, wanting change, revolution, a more uh, equal distribution of resources that is Uranus. It's the maverick, the rebel. And also trying to uh, get back our personal power. So uh, there is a high tension between those two forces at the, at the very present time. And uh, because it's the last time we're going to feel it this fall, so it's, it's kind of a breaking free from this... Um, constraint, if you will. And also because the North Node conjuncts Uranus, so North Node represents our collective karma, what we're um, moving towards uh, collectively in order to uh, well grow spiritually. So uh, we're moving more towards Uranus, so decentralization of the powers, um, freeing ourselves from the powers that be or the powers that were, depending on how we see it. So essentially so, what you're saying is universe has stacked the deck towards Uranus here. So the yeah. bad time, the bad guys' time is up here, so to speak. And that's why perhaps they're freaking out and they're trying to accelerate a lot of those plans. Uh, very quickly here, Jay, I hear you, I see you nodding. Do you want to chime in on this here before we go a little bit more into the decode itself? What, what do you want to share on this Saturn mm -hmm. Uranus square? You had mentioned in the last show, the last fight between the Pisceans and the Aquarians. Explain and that's what this audience. is. Yeah. This is the 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 fight. The Saturns are are the are the Pisceans clinging on to their life and their what, what they've created for two thousand years. And the Ur Uranians or whatever you would call them, they're they're on the forces of Aquarius and they're breaking free. And um, and you see that battle going on, you know, all, all across the world right now. And the um, the destruction of the supply chain that is the that 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 is the decentralization. That's the first uh, aspect of the, what I call the great decentralization that's coming. We're not centralizing. We're decentralizing. We're going to use the tools that they think they're going to use to control every aspect of our lives. We're going to use those same tools to decentralize. Yeah. Okay. Very, Very good. Much agree. Uh, and also, interestingly enough, Uranus in the sign of Taurus, I'm using tropical astrology, which is more um, um, connected with the Earth, uh, the Earth and the Sun relationship. So Uranus in Taurus has to do a lot with uh, natural cataclysm and um, 
climate change, well, not climate change as <laughs> is being brought by the media, but more like uh, big changes in the earth um, with, let's say, earthquakes. Um, it could be also all sorts of uh, cataclysm. So earth changes, new, new continents yeah, going changes. and coming, maybe. Uh, Jay, I'll get you to chime in on perhaps that lost continent uh, that is actually not lost. We'll get into that maybe a little bit later on the show. OK, uh, Julie, let's go back into. Um, yeah, if you can just go back to the slide before so I can just finish right and then we'll get into Dolores's interpretation of yeah it too and see how that ties in go ahead yeah so um and then it says second line Saturn again will make a late return so I immediately immediately thought about um some kind of organization or a country that will have his Saturn return but the word that was bogging me at first was again so meaning there's another Saturn return. So I looked at uh, a couple charts from different organizations and countries, and then I found that the European Union were having their first Saturn return right as we're uh, speaking. So, and I'm pretty sure he's talking about Europe there because he's talking about Narbonne, which is a French city. And so it seemed like it was very much centered around Europe. So European Union charts would make sense to me. And then, um, in the Dolores Cannon's uh, interpretation of that uh, quatrain, she said that um, he was referring to Saturn being retrograde. And then I understood that um, they had their first um, Saturn return in April of this year, the EU, and then Saturn went retrograde. So it's still retrograde right now as we speak. And then in January of next year, it's going to hit again the the exact place to make a Saturn return. So it's like the second hit of that Saturn return. So that would make sense since he used the word again. Mm. And uh, third line, the empire is transferred towards the broad nation. So there's many interpretations of that one, but I'm thinking more of this new world order and emp evil empire as it makes its transition to this age of Aquarius where uh, decentralization broad is also spelled differently in English, but it makes me uh, believe there's a connection there. And also uh, fourth line, it says, the eye plucked out at Narbonne by a hawk. And then this one, I was very puzzled about it. Um, I, was, I was thinking about maybe he's thinking about the all seeing eye. Uh, this power, but then it brought me to reading more of Dolores Cannon book. And that was a, an amazing synchronicity because I received uh, an email from someone in the community. You got to read that book. Well, there's three in total. And then uh, JC sent me the cover for that um, episode that we're doing right now. And the, the same morning that I got this email and then I already ordered the book and they just arrived by, <laughs> by mail uh, the same morning. So that was like a series of synchronicities. I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I'll read it. So I did. And then we can go ahead and, and just um, read the second slide. Okay, let me bring that up. The thing about, uh, let me bring that up also. There, uh, I'm excited to what you're going to say here in, uh, with respect to Dolores's interpretation. But just recently also, um, Putin, who in the web bought data, in uh, Edgar yeah. Casey's prophecy was said that, you know, Russia would eventually save the world. And here he is, and this is a falcon, but somebody reminded me that in Ukrainian and in Russian, uh, the word for this bird is a hawk. It's the same word. <laughs> so I was like, ah, okay, so is he uh, uh, plucking the eye of the all-seeing eye here? Uh, that makes sense also. Jay, quickly, yeah. on that, what are your thoughts here before we go to the next slide? Well, I think if I remember my history right, wasn't Narbonne the uh, the Jewish Empire in southern France? Um, it, it was I, an I old Italian port, and it has a bunch of these um, um, labyrinths of tunnels, and a lot of people are yeah. saying, "Hey, right, right, right." This yeah, there's like a, there, it's a, it's actually a very special place. Yeah. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what the Eye of Narbonne is, but um, uh, it does have a, an incredible history. And I'm sure mm -hmm. Nostradamus was very familiar because he was Jewish. And I, I do believe that um, I do. I do believe there was a Jewish uh, uh, actually an independent country in, in that mm -hmm. area, like you maybe 700, 800 AD um, mm -hmm. that was eventually vanquished by the church. But uh, it, it was there for a short time. So I don't know. Wow. Oh, 
Wow. Okay, that's another uh, lead to follow here. Okay, yeah. Julie, let me bring that second slide uh, for you to uh, run through here with the audience. Go ahead. Okay, so I found the pages. Well, Dolores Cannon in her book, she's um, putting someone into trance to communicate with Nostradamus. So she's having messages uh, through a, um, a channel uh, to help us decipher the quatrains, basically. So these are uh, what pertains to the uh, quatrain. So he says that in this quatrain, he's referring to a period of time in which there is a war and the event happens near this end of this war at the final stages where when Saturn is again late, so late retrograde. He says that statement has a double meaning. On the one hand, he, it refers to a, an astrological event of Saturn being in retrograde to help narrow down the time involved. So. I think this EU uh, second uh, Saturn return is to give us more of a time reference because ta Saturn is the planet of time. So this line is more like to, to give us an, an indication on when the prediction is going to happen. And then uh, it also refers to some of the technology in this war. So I believe we're already in this war. <laughs> I don't think he's talking about something that's ahead of time. In this war, as in all wars, there are great advances done in research of science, both weapons research and things like that. In this war, the scientists are researching how to work and alter time to help change some events, to swing the war over to their advantage. And they have failed yet again. As a result of this second failure, the entire complex is destroyed in a large catastrophe. That's the eye being plucked out by a Goshawk. Some mm -hmm. translations say Goshawk, others say Hawk. Because they are dealing with powers they don't know how to control and it rips them apart. What happened was that the vortices of energy they are trying to deal with were not fine-tuned enough to work with and they got out of control. So far as the catastrophe is concerned, it will be very localized and will have some strange side effects in the dimension of time in the general area there. It will eventually ha have far reaching effects because the government was counting on that line of research to give it an edge in the war. And some of that edge is taken away and it will end up affecting the outcome of the war, the, war, the third war. So pretty much we're, what we're in. Yep. Go so, ahead. yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Jay, do you want to chime in here? There's, there's a couple of things I want to bring up. You're, I see you nodded. What do you want to add? Uh, no, uh, go ahead. I just I think you're right. We are in that war. Uh, we're in the war right now. And it's a weird war. Mm -hmm. And uh, not, a, not a standard uh, kinetic war. We're not mm -hmm. in the kinetic. Well, no, we may have gotten into the kinetic war now that the uh, uh, gas line was uh, sabotaged. So that could be the, the and, 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 you know, we're pretty much, sorry, we know who did it, you know. I, mean, <laughs> I played a video last night on my uncensored pay-per-view of uh, President Biden saying, of yeah. course, that if uh, so-and-so would attack, that they would deal with the pipelines. I'm like, you heard it from the horse's mouth before the fact, so you don't have to look too hard. But what Jay's saying also here was very interesting uh, in this last rally, and we'll choose our words here uh, carefully. But if you look at the flag here behind them, uh, we were told that this meant really at this point we were in the open warfare part of this particular engagement. So a lot of people on our chat who are military oriented uh, commented that on that as well. And it was interesting also that you kind of see the stripes here as gold and silver, perhaps alluding to this new uh, financial system also uh, being uh, bimetallic. So there's a lot there in that symbology and uh, time will tell here. Uh, but I think Jay's right here. We are now in that last phase and it's also in uh, in public view, to some extent, at least for those of people who are searching and not necessarily watching the six o'clock news. Well, now, you, you, you got to remember that this war is not like a war between countries. This is like a, a, mm -hmm. a civil war all over the world. And it's the war between the Aquarians and the Pisceans. Mm -hmm. It's a war between centralization and decentralization. It's a war between the WEF and the people who just want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. And and, and in order to um, facilitate this thing, us Aquarians have got to get going. We got we can't just sit around and just think that because time is coming our way that this is all going to happen. No, we have to 
We have to start forming communities, find our tribes, uh, start growing our own food, taking care of ourselves, learning how to do medicine. Uh, we're we're going to lose it all. It's, mm -hmm. it's all going to go away. You're not even going to be able to, uh, gas is going to be 15 bucks a gallon. You're not going to be able to go to the hospital. So um, this is where we're headed. And, um, uh, and, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the Pisceans are actually being very militaristic right now and authoritarian, uh, kind of surprising, actually. Mm -hmm. But that's what happens when you corner a dog. And you know, Sometimes when you push too far, it's this far and no further. You wake up uh, the sleeping giant. I think it was the, the line from World War II here with uh, yep. Japan. Um, well, let's bring this up here. Also, when I created this poster originally, I didn't have a title. And I, ha I heard a hard voice, uh, the vortex of time. And I was like, oh. Okay, that sounds good. And only that day did Julie send me uh, this particular part of the wow. interpretation where they talk about these vortices of energies being used and it right here and the control of time. Now, is it possible, Jay, that we're already and Julie also seeing some of these effects here? A lot of people have uh, yes. mentioned for the last number of years this Mandela effect where time seems yeah. to have been warping. The reality is one thing for one part of the population. It's something else for another part of the population. And also, I just wanted to mention something. When you said this particular uh, engagement, I'll say engagement for now, just to not trigger too much of the algos with the bad words. Uh, but in this particular engagement, like Cliff High was saying on his videos too, it's no longer one king pitting his soldiers against another king's soldiers. No, no, no. This is the king against their own soldiers. That we're ha we're seeing this across yeah. our country, or across the it's world, right. where country states are actually fighting their own citizens. That's that's the nature of, of what we're looking at. But well, Jay, on this country. idea of Mandela effect, what, what would you say to that? Is that part of this? Maybe. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Mandela, as well? well, you know, the Mandela effect is is a weird thing, but we also have to remember that with technology, uh, people can can screw with stuff too. So, I mean, George Lucas is uh, infamous for screwing with the Star Wars films, adding new clips and new things, and and, and really, that's kind of really confuses the issue um, a lot. But there are weird things. I mean, definitely the the Jaws from uh, uh, the Bond film, uh, Moon Moonraker. I mean, I, I remember that film when it came out, and he had the girl had braces on, and you know, and the whole point of the joke is that she has braces on, and then the guy with the silver teeth, they fall in love with each other, and they walk away into the sunset. That's the whole point. But now her braces are gone. Why would they remove the braces? I have no idea. Uh, but the movie doesn't make any sense without it. So there is mm -hmm. there is a strange thing going on. There's no doubt about it. And um, but what's really going on here, and 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 you guys were talking about it so good, is that we were the only way that the Piscean world could function is through Saturnian time. That we have to all agree to meet at the airport at certain times. So we take the plane. We got all this stuff that that we had, and and, and so the control of time was mm -hmm. essential to the Piscean age. But COVID came, and we all shut down, and that gave the Aquarians the inch that they needed to have to get in there, and so. All of a sudden, we we started preaching. I mean, I did. I think all the Aquarians were saying, you know, work twice as much at home, make your output twice as much. So when the, the guy at work, when 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 they want to bring you back, you say, no, I'm 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 doing I'm doing more than my share. I want to stay home, mm -hmm. right? And that and, and the same thing with the truck drivers. The reason that the supply chain is screwed up is nobody wants to drive trucks anymore. It's a seriously hard job. It's 14, 15 hours of dangerous work every day. You're on the road. You never see your wife or kids. Um, and then, you know, you got to stay home for a year. And then you're like, you know, this is pretty nice. I don't think I want to go back. And mm -hmm. so nobody's going back to work. And so the Aquarians are winning. I know the chaos is could look scary, but chaos is also, you know, the, those um, cymatics where they they take the sand and they put a, a, a frequency and, it, and when they change the frequency, the sand all gets confused before it forms into another uh, geometry. 
Mm -hmm. we're in that confused state right now in between where they're changing the frequencies and then that's the signs are changing. That's the mm -hmm. frequency changing. And so everything's confused. And but the Aquarians all know it's can they're cool, man. They're cool. But it, chaos can be fun, chaos can be good, but you have to prep for it. So mm -hmm. Aquarians are more prepared than the Pisces. Because Pisceans keep thinking that the same thing is just going to keep occurring. The supply chains are never going to break down. The food's always going to be here. And, and it, that's not what's going to happen. And, and my good. money's safe in the bank. And my my retirement yeah. fund is absolutely safe. Don't, don't worry. Everything's yeah. good. <laughs> and and so, it's not true. Yeah. And, no. and so, you know, we, where I live, we're forming a community, a, mm -hmm. a community that's taking care of each other, you know, and um, and everybody it's possible. It's not impossible. But you, the number one thing you should be using the Internet for is to find people that live in your area that think like you do mm -hmm. and then have meetings and and and, and exchange things and uh, ideas and protect yourself from. Uh, uh, the, the forces, of the Piscean forces mostly, yeah. who are now becoming authoritarian mm -hmm. in, as they're losing their grip on, on reality. So you can find people like-minded in your community, but if they're not close by, you can always find them online here at Reality <laughs> Check on YouTube and also at Maison Jupiter, where we bring all of this community together uh, for you guys while we still can here, even though there's some difficulties uh, with a lot going on. On that note, guys, I just wanted to let you know also, uh, I might have to be moving here to Rumble uh, very soon. We just saw Russell Brand uh, the other day also being kicked off of YouTube, making the move now. Uh, so if you want to check that out, rumble.com forward slash C, as in channel, forward slash Beyond Mystic. I'll bring that in the live chat. Uh, please do go and subscribe there in case we have more disruptions here. Uh, this is my third backup channel on YouTube. Not sure I'll be coming back if they <laughs> don't invite me back here the next time. So we'll see. So anyways, in the meantime, go and subscribe there to my Rumble. And I might have actually a really cool brand new series for you guys here coming up as soon as next week. So if you're interested in that, please do go check it out. Uh, Julie, let's get into, well, first of all, uh, Julie, is there anything else you wanted to yeah. find the audience here on that first quadrain and based oh. on what also uh, Jay was saying before we move to the next one? Go ahead. I just wanted to add something with what Jay was saying earlier with the time and uh, those events in 2020 that uh, took us out of that matrix timing, if you wish. Like I felt it personally. I, um, I rethought about how I invested my time and uh, where it was leading me in the end game. So let's say I, I never was like a big watcher of, te uh, of television, but I was like, oh, okay, if I uh, invest my time in that particular thing, is it going to bring me um, closer to my uh, long-term goals, let's say. So, and then I, I started to review all of my time investments and I was like, oh, I want to learn even more astrology. I want to do that and this and that. And I feel that it's going to get me closer to what I believe is my life mission. So I totally changed the way personally I... Uh, thought about time and energy investment and i feel like it's a very common theme around me well not everybody did it but uh i feel like it's a very important time um management uh, item that talks about this uranus and taurus because taurus where the north node is for one year and a half is like where do you invest your resources so mm -hmm. since we're getting out of that saturnian uh, timeline and we're trying to go towards more the uh, Uranian type of life. So being more present in the moment and better uh, investing our resources. So there is a change there, Uranus and Taurus. So we're changing how we're investing all our resources. So once you uh, in invest your energy, well, which is about Taurus too, energy is a, uh, Taurus is about energy and, and investment. It could be money, it could be time, it could be energy. So I think we all had to review uh, collectively and personally the way we invest those things. And it's part of this big change that we're in, I think. And, and yeah, more than also, before, people woke up. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Uh, Jay, go ahead. I just want to say that Taurus also is like um, uh, gardening, cooking, yes. all those things that you're going to need to do to survive mm -hmm. what's happening. So mm -hmm. that's yeah, very totally. interesting. It's all I, the old way of uh, producing products, also the yeah. traditional way. Yeah, I totally agree mm -hmm. with that. And it, it rules food. So we're also changing the way that we produce our food. Right. And uh, yeah, let, getting back to the more traditional way of doing those things. You guys don't want to eat crickets? 
<laughs> we'll get into the Carl, Carl uh, <laughs> uh, wet dream there of everybody eating crickets. Uh, Jay, let's take a quick side note here. I'm going to change my a little animation on top of you there. You're a big fan of the moon. And I was just as we're having this conversation about Saturn in time, I did this video a couple of times. Let me see if I can bring up that other screen here for a sec. But I talked about how maybe the moon was a repeater station of sorts for this time matrix that we're in. And as we're breaking the matrix, what does that mean to the moon? We're seeing more and more activity. China just announced now that they're going to be mining this new type of space dust here that they've just found. Jay, how do you bring that into perhaps a recalibration of our relationship with time if in fact the moon was a repeater station for that matrix? What would you say? Well, um, I think we need to find a way to uh, um, spiritually shield ourselves from some of the effects of the moon um, because it is the repeater station for, for Saturn. It, it has a 29 day cycle. Saturn has a 29 year cycle. Um, it's a fractal of uh, in time uh, of the two rotations and um uh, and the, and the moon is a you know it's it it has a deleterious effect on us it really does so I think the as we go into the uh, next age we have to find ways to uh, alleviate the power that the moon has over us spiritually physically I'm super inter interested in the Artemis project the United States is going back. To the moon, they say, uh, there's been nothing but delays. Uh, one problem after another, you know, in 1969, we could go to the moon. Eh, no problem. Today, we can't go at all. We can't get the technology to go. And they're not even sending men anyway. They're just going there, going to orbit the moon and come back. So the, that, uh, again, there's a, there's a lot of theater going on around that. The, mm -hmm. the big problem with space travel is something that they don't want to tell you about, but is that it's super dangerous. Um, the radiation outside of our atmosphere is is deadly, completely deadly. Even NASA says you need six or two meters of uh, lead between you and the outside world to shield yourself. So this whole idea that they're going to go to the moon and, and it is, it's dubious. I hate to say it, but it's a dubious thing. And I think it's just, part of their theater. And mm -hmm. uh, again, I don't know. I mean, the Chinese went there, they took three or four photographs and then their camera broke. Um, so if it did break, I mean, you know, we don't know. And uh, so there's just a lot of weirdness on and about the moon that has always fascinated me. And, um, you know, I, I go back to something I read in a free Masonic, very rare free Masonic book, that I read like 25 years ago. And basically it said that we came from Sirius long, long time ago and the moon was our ark. And we, um, the moon was our ship that we took and we parked it in orbit. And, um, and it's a, it's a, 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 a bashed in spaceship, you might say. All the meteors keep hitting it. Okay, you're blowing a lot of minds of a lot of people in the live chat, Jay. That's a whole other episode right there. Uh, we'll have you on for sure. And I was just reminded to the audience, Jay and I did this uh, decoding Kubrick episode where we looked at the Apollo landings. I have to find that because I think it was one of those that we lost uh, during one of these um, deletion processes. You don't happen to have a copy of that, do you, Jay? You never record what we do, right? Okay. Yeah. Somebody had said to me uh, maybe a year ago, JC, I have your old episodes with Jay Widener, and I keep trying to reach him to download those episodes back and put them back on for you guys, maybe on Rumble. But, wow, that was a fascinating show, Jay. If not, we'll have to do it again because there's a lot there. And specifically now, I think it's important to look at. Okay. Uh, we're 48 minutes in. Julie, let's get into the second quatrain here, the 428. Set this up for the yeah. audience. Okay, so uh, there's another one I was guided to look at because I think it pertains to something that's going to uh, happen very soon. Uh, it says when Venus will be covered by the sun. So I'm thinking right away of the eclipses we're going to have on October 25th. That will be exactly conjunct or 
very, very close to be exactly conjunct Venus. They're all going to be at two degrees, so Sun, Moon, and uh, Venus. And Venus will be in its superior conjunction, so meaning behind the Sun from our point of view on Earth, So, which totally makes sense with the prediction. So when Venus will be covered by the Sun, under the splendor will be a hidden form. And uh, so there's something there that's like a mystery that will uh, be behind. But the, I found that amusing that in French, they use the word occult, occult, which they didn't keep in the translation uh, in English. And for me, occult refers to the sign of Scorpio, which this eclipse will be in. So for me, it's another clue that I might be right uh, associating this quatrain to the eclipse on October 25th. And then Mercury will have exposed them to the fire. And in Dolores Cannon's book, they're talking about uh, more of a, let's say a spiritual translation of that. So Mercury in astrology rules communication, social media, knowledge, learning. So exposed to the light of knowledge, communication, and also social media. So that's my personal adding there. And uh, lastly, it says, by a rumor of war will be affronted. So, uh, and in the book, I'm just gonna get there. Uh, they're talking about this being an announcement for an ET visitation. And that would cause a lot of social unrest, especially for the countries uh, being at war at the time being. Isn't that fascinating also the ET component Cliff High was picking up in his Web about data starting last fall that sometime this summer this year we would be talking about ETs in a big way in one of his last videos he's saying that perhaps here in the uh, unveiling of the big ugly which is the situation we're in now uh, that there might be a situation where we'll call them the bad guys here for a second might use that old project blue beam type of alien invasion type of scenario to change the narrative on us here jay how how first reaction to looking at this slide and how does that tie in for you well i mean it's very interesting and for sure i mean scorpio is also you know right next to the uh, center of the galaxy Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, cross of Hende is definitely talking about the uh, center of the galaxy and this time period as being very important because it's the great cross. So in 19, um, around 1992, we went at right angles to the center of the galaxy. And for 20 years until 2012, we were in this and we're still in it. And this is when, where all the stuff happens whenever we get into one of these crossings. And mm. uh, we won't really get out of this crossing until about 2028 20, or something like that. And, um, and again, the people in charge know all this um, and they use it to their advantage. Um, but um, yeah, no, I think, uh, I think that, uh, uh, um, I think that this is a, this quatrain is actually telling us that uh, we're going to actually win. Mm -hmm. that uh, um you know that uh, we're going to win in a in a weird way you know it's not going to be the old way it's going to be a new way well <laughs> weird weird is the operating word because oh never... also i've been told by the way that the ets are going we they are going to introduce us to the ets like within the next 6 months that's i've been told by a high ranking intelligence person mm -hmm. wow. They have been setting the stage all year. They had that first Pentagon report that came out, yep. and now Congress just last month uh, came out to say, hey, uh, these are not man-made, and the threat is increasing exponentially. So they're setting the stage here for that particular announcement, uh, Jay. I agree with you. Uh, Julie, as you mentioned, the October 25th um, eclipse here, I'll bring up that slide from our last show here at the Astro Wu Finance we just recorded uh, uh, the other day. Is there anything else here that ties in perhaps with uh, the Nostradamus uh, prophecy as well that you want to share with the audience or could they just take a quick um, screenshot yeah. here? What do you want to do? Yeah, well, I think uh, this whole um, series of eclipses that we're going to have, so October 25th and then November 8th, they're in the financial axis of Taurus and Scorpio. So of course it has to do with the big transition that we're about to make with let's say, a uh, change to our uh, way of uh, transactioning with money and our financial structure. So I think this is going to be a collapse point of the, the old financial system, the central banks, which is ruled by Scorpio. And this eclipse is in the sign of Scorpio. So there is going to be, I think, a lot of um, uh, instability 
And I feel like um, people might be very um, fearful with all the changes that are going to happen for sure, because we're going to be in the midst of this whole transition. So I feel like the link there with the prophecy, because later on we're talk we're going to talk about Dolores Cannon interpretation and why they're using Venus to uh, come to Earth or make contact with the Earth, because Venus in astrology represents love. So put, getting more of this love vibration onto Earth, helping of our in our spiritual growth, spiritual evolution, not getting caught in the fear factor of this whole transition that f I feel like a lot of people are um, very fearful of the changes that are about to come, but they're inevitable, I think. Right. So I feel like there's a great connection between this transition that we're making with the financial system, but also this need for us to um have our faith in the universe and also live more in this love vibration so is yep. it possible julie here that this venus being covered here and we'll get into the interpretation here with uh dolores uh but we might have so the the reinforcements basically are coming in from venus here as that particular alignment we'll get into that but also maybe the bad guys are going to try to bring this blue beam uh, thing for us to think that they're all enemies as opposed to our friends so again all of this is going to be in the air and we're going to have to use discernment but explain here the yeah. um, the decode here with dolores and what perhaps that means and i read the book over and they they didn't say they're coming from venus but they're using the fact that venus is covered up to uh, align with the earth to um, move towards the earth so it says during the time of troubles at a point when the sun is between the earth and venus and thus from the earth's point of view venus will appear to be hidden by the sun there will be a visitation from the watchers so that's nostradamus talking through dolores cannon's uh, book a visitation from the watchers, those who have kept an eye on mankind's development. They will approach from the direction of Venus, so they too will be temporarily hidden by the sun, but they will be exposed through the powers of Mercury, that is, through the powers of observation and communication. They will find out more about what it is and who the watchers are when this event takes place. However, as it is to be during the time of troubles, this definite proof that there are others out there in the universe will cause great social unrest and panic in some countries that are particularly involved with wars and such. And then lastly, the planetary influences upon the Earth will be acting to try to bring about, as you say, more spiritual love among mankind. He says this is another reason why the Watchers chose to come back into contact with mankind at this time, for they are trying to help along mankind's spiritual growth in general. Okay, the Watchers there. Jay, I hear your ears are burning here. So how do you relate this to the Watchers, perhaps the Nephilims, the Giants, the people who've disappeared from this planet? Tie that in for the audience from your perspective. Well, yeah, there's, you know... Um, You'd have to be, you know, very well unread person to not know that all over the earth, um, people keep meeting uh, beings that yeah. are helping us and influencing us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Akhenaten was walking down the Nile one day uh, and he looked up and a silver ship was above him and it told him to start a new religion. So he started a new religion based on what the ship told him to do. Um, I've covered this in many places. There's cults all over the world. Uh, President Obama's mom is in a UFO cult uh, in Indonesia. Um, uh, so uh, the ETs are, have been influencing us for a long time. And um, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm one of those people, I believe that they've disarmed all of our nuclear weapons. I think that was one of the things that they were doing. And mm -hmm. so I'm not worried about a nuclear war at all. I'm worried about war but not a nuclear war. And, um, and I believe that if they're going to make an appearance, this is the time to do it. This is, we, we need you now more than ever. We have the, our leadership in every country is completely out of their minds. And um, we need something to stir the system up really fast. Mm -hmm. okay. And how do you connect that to the watchers? I think you and I had talked about this um maybe in context of the flooding do you remember that conversation we had uh, i'm trying to remember the context of that show 
And I remember, I don't know if there was also in the Zechariah uh, Sitchin uh, material where he's talking about these watchers. Um, oh, man, I'm drawing a blank. That's well, not right. That's the you, watchers but... are the, the beings in the book of Enoch. Enoch. The, yeah, okay. the book of Enoch. And they, they, they watch us and they probably live on the moon. If you're going to watch the earth, the moon is where you'd want to be. So, um, uh, and they watch us and they observe us and they nudge us around and they push us around. And, and, you know, sometimes they take their ships out down and get water out of our lakes and steal cows sometimes and uh, demand sacrifices. And, you know, in the past, they used to demand sacrifices to, uh, to them, not human sacrifice, but animals, and they would eat them. And uh, so, uh, yeah, they've been here all the entire time and uh, they've had a huge influence on us. And like I said, they're, they're going to come. This is now the time. Um, and, and from what I'm hearing, that's what's going to happen. So everything I'm hearing coincides with what, what I'm hearing here. Wow. Hmm. OK, um, Julie, I know you had uh, we, I forgot to bring up the actual astrological yeah. chart for the first quatrain. Do you want me to go back there and do you want did you want to point at or do you want to just leave here with the second one and explain this one here? Or well, that one was uh, for uh, the October 25th eclipse. So you can see in the well, in the eighth house. So in Scorpio, we're having the sun, the moon, Venus and the wow. south node all conjunct into the side of Scorpio. So that's going to be our eclipse on October 25th. And what's kind of uh, interesting about it is that both well, sun and moon together, it means a new moon. So that's uh, that's normal. But the uh, Venus is also at the same de same degree as the sun and the moon so two degrees and two degrees according to uh, the degree theory in astrology relates to the sign of Taurus which is also about currency and money which is the opposing sign of this eclipse so you can see that this eclipse has a lot of uh, themes about the financial system potential collapse and we're opening up a new chapter on a new moon eclipse but also it's conjuncting the south node which talk about purging everything that's been dysfunctional uh, in the scorpio theme so issues of power struggles are connected to scorpio uh, deep trauma healing from also past lifetimes and current lifetimes which is scorpio and the the, the south node also so I feel like there is going to be a big, uh, on the upside, a big healing energy available uh, on this eclipse and around the months. Wow, fascinating. Uh, there's somebody in the chat, Monica says, hey, JC, Elena Danan, who I've interviewed before in her uh, book, um, I don't have it in front of me here we did two of her book uh, reviews here on the show uh she's been saying she's a contactee and she's been saying that uh, the watchers recently came back into our solar system this leads me to the question jay because yes in the book of enoch we talk about these watchers and from what you've described they're not too pleasant uh, to mankind i think perhaps here i'm wondering if nostradamus was referring to those watchers or perhaps a higher um frequency bandwidth of watchers that are not normally here that are now coming back to the solar system, which might explain also why the Vatican was using this, the, the, um, how do you call it? The, uh, not the devil telescope, uh, Lucifer, Satan, Lucifer <laughs> telescope. Yeah. yeah. So are they talking about a different band of watchers, more uh, um, guardians of the galaxies? What do you think? Both of you go ahead. Well, I heard, what I heard is that, um, that the watchers, uh, were told that they have to come back here and fix what they did and that's what's mm. going on and that they're kind of, they, they've been kind of scolded by whoever their authorities are and told that what they did here was unforgivable and that they need to go back and fix it and that that is what they're attempting to do is is, is what i've been told Hmm. That makes sense. Okay. And uh, guys, yes, the book was A Gift from the Stars, Alien Races uh, from Elena Danan. Go check out that, that video is still uh, on my YouTube for now. Uh, Julie, anything else you wanted to add to that? The Watchers, that particular book, maybe some other uh, stories on how this perhaps is tying in here? Yeah, I think she was talking more recently. She named them the Cedars, that they were um, like a council of many different races here to help us not on a physical level but more on a spiritual spiritual level so i believe she was talking about cedars that were more uh in contact with the earth recently so mm -hmm. it's hard to uh, validate any of those series but it's just information to put out there i believe 
Okay. Uh, Jay, we're already in, at the hour mark here. There's two things we wanted to talk about also before we leave uh, the audience. Uh, this Rudolf Steiner uh, prediction, we'll bring that up. And also this context of Aramon and the push now towards this AI God new model where you kind of mentioned earlier where we're all synthesized in under one type of control system. Let's get into Rudolf Steiner first and share that with the audience members. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so 100 years ago, or more than 100 years ago, 1920, Rudolf Steiner made a couple of really interesting predictions. He predicted that there would be a, um, a um, well, he called it like an inoculation mm -hmm. that would appear and that it would be forced upon everyone and that it would remove our spiritual, our ability to think spiritually. Men would eventually inoculate themselves against their soul or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it essentially yeah. gets rid of your soul. Yeah. It gets rid of any thought about your soul. Mm -hmm. And so Steiner uh, also uh, said uh, very interestingly that at the beginning of the third decade of the 21st century, i.e. 2020, that um, Araman would make his first appearance. And Araman is the logical extension of Lucifer. So in, in Steinerian consciousness, you have three kinds of consciousness. You have Christ consciousness, which isn't necessarily Jesus Christ, but it's a consciousness of that you're mostly a spiritual being living in a physical world. You're compassionate towards all living beings. And, you know, you, you try to practice love and that kind of thing. Then there's the Luciferian. And that's not the devil. Luciferian is technology. It's the belief that you can make this, you can perfect this world through technology. And that's what the Luciferian consciousness is. It's not anything evil, although to the Christ consciousness people, it is evil because they know you can't perfect this world, first off, and you can certainly can't perfect it through technology. That's the last yeah. way you're going to be able to do it. And then finally, Steiner said that this Luciferian consciousness, which is a reaction to the Christ consciousness uh, 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 thoughts, will eventually turn into the Aramonic forces and that would be total and complete synthetic control over everything on earth and he said this 100 over 100 years ago that this is the progression that is going to happen unless we stop it so he started like the waldorf schools and um, tried to bring back uh, natural uh, ways to plant food and uh, bring back you know a more natural way of life and in an effort to to get in front of the coming Aramonic uh, consciousness. And that is exactly what we have to do to get uh, uh, to make sure that the Aramonic forces are kept in check. And that is we have to um, we have to live in Christ consciousness and in, inside a, a very vicious world. And we have to forgive people when they're mean to us and you can't lie and you can't cheat and you can't. You have, to, you have to live in a, in a certain way, and it drives the Luciferians and the Aramonic people out of their minds, but that's what we have to do. And in this great decentralization, those spiritual values are going to be really, really important. Yeah. It pisses them I, off when you're in the love frequency or the higher frequencies. And this is why I smile a lot on my show. People say, why do you keep giggling? I'm like, well, I'm trying to ward off the attacks of all of these demonic <laughs> uh, Arameans. Uh, another way to do that, of course, um, uh, to avoid that particular timeline and consequences is um, preserving and fighting for our free speech. Uh, Julie, what yeah. did Nostradamus have to say about that as well? And how does that tie into right now the battles that both Jay, myself and yourself have been fighting here on these various yeah. platforms? Well, Saturn in Aquarius is all about censorship. So uh, how do you control the population? It's through the information that, that they're allowed to, to find, but also to share. So it's all about Aquarius is um, sharing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe he was saying in the uh, interview that Janine did, well, not an interview, but the channeling that Janine did, he said through her that we were going to be confronted with serious uh, censorship issues and that it had to be very important that we keep sharing this type of information because that's the core of the war we're in. If people uh, don't get access to this kind of information, then the awakening uh, potential uh, is very dim. Mm -hmm. And if I can add also to what Jay was just saying about Steiner, I believe he also said that these uh, inoculation would uh, attack more the etheric body yeah. of human 
than the physical bodies. So it has to do with your relationship to the stars, to the earth, to your own relationship to the divine uh, in the creation. So to be in contact with the earth, all the cycles of the earth also. So all your divine connection to, um, to the earth, which is uh, also allowing you to um, spiritually evolve. So that's kind of cut off from you because you're uh, stuck in a bubble and you can't uh, communicate with other um, living divine beings. So that's the way I understood it. And that's interesting yeah. also. Oh, go ahead, Jay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to say the, the um, what's going on today is very curious because everybody is... Uh, we're having this gigantic argument. Everybody's in this argument, but everybody is arguing just from the left side of their brain. They've got it all figured out. Everybody's got everything all figured out. They've figured it all out in their left side of their brain, and they're not going to have anyone tell them what to do or what reality is because they've got it all figured out. <laughs> but what, and I'm talking about everybody, the people on our side, their side, we're all doing it, and we're not putting in any of the right side of our brain into our a construction of our debate. And so there's no compassion in the debate. There's no love in the debate. It's just a clash of ideas. And uh, anyone who actually thinks they've got reality figured out is insane. So uh, you, your reality is moment to moment. And so the whole world is just uh, arguing from the left side of the brain. And it's time for us to take a deep breath and bring in the right side of our brain here and have some compassion for the people on the other side, even if we fervently disagree. And we have to all come to the conclusion that our reality is, in fact, transitory. The nature of it, at least, is very transitory. So, again, there are big changes for all of us. Guys, if you want to have more of this amazing wisdom and depth of knowledge, uh, please go visit Reality Check here on YouTube. And you can find uh, Jay's work and his books also here on jwidener.com. Uh, uh, Jay, let's talk about a Reality Check here. What's coming up? Any new interviews you want to point to the audience members here who can go and peruse uh, your video and library? What are you excited about and what are you working on right now? Now on reality check with Jay Weiner. Well, I, I have a good show coming out on Saturday, The Mystery of the uh, Do Dropa Stones, which are the stones that are found in China um, that are uh, 12,000 years old. And um, we're covering a lot of uh, alchemy, European uh, alchemy, and um, reading from my first book, A Monument to the End of Time, uh, every Wednesday night. Uh, I'll be uh, f uh, finishing up that book over the next couple of months. And uh, I'm really what I'm trying to do now, because I'm under threat to um, uh, JC, too. I just got my first notice that I'm on my way to my first strike. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're literally treating me like I'm two years old. Like, yeah. You can never do that again. You can't say that. You can't say this. They're not telling me what I said either. <laughs> just telling me that I said it. But I don't know what right. I said. So, right. um, well, yeah. So I'm on the edge of going to rumble myself, it looks like. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know. We'll see. YouTube stinks. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, folks, so in the meantime, yes, uh, please, I just put the link in the uh, live chat for you guys now to make it easy. If you just want to click on this link here, it'll bring you to Reality Check. Please subscribe for now and also follow there in the About section. Uh, you'll see the links and notification if uh, um, Jay actually moves to Rumble also. Uh, Jay, do you already have a Rumble uh, um, channel set up for now or no? No, I haven't. I, I, I'm, you know, I've been, I'm a, a reluctant guy here. I just really like <laughs> I like you on well, YouTube because it's just so like, like you like like you. I understood that the fight was here on YouTube. This is where we we're capturing the most yeah. of the souls, and this is why we're still here fighting for this territory. Yeah. But there comes a time here where we're going to change from that particular uh, circumstance of W A R to a rebuilding of the new here. So we might have to also adapt. Uh, you and I, Jay, <laughs> as we yeah, continue. and uh, and Jenny did say when she was channeling Nostradamus in that video that Nostradamus was saying to us that we had to to uh, change and move to other platform where uh, they were not censoring us as quickly as we can to ma make sure that we maintain the information and the, the knowledge transfer. Right, right, right. And talking about uh, knowledge and transformation and understanding how all of these astrological um, bodies influence your life. Uh, Julie, what do you have for the audience members here on MaisonJupiter.com as it pertains to them understanding and better charting their course in their own life with the um, energies from these astrological bodies? 
Yeah, so I have on my website, it's a personalized birth chart. It's a digital format. So it's a printable and frameable poster in the color of your choice. And it represents your birth chart. So the planets in their uh, position in the sky at the moment you were born. So that's pretty much your blueprint for your incarnation here on Earth. And it says a lot about you. You're going to find a lot of information there. And it comes with a 15 to 20 pages report explaining your alignment. So I think that's a great start in uh, knowing more about yourself well there you go guys and if you use the coupon code beyond mystic you'll get an extra uh 10 off uh, jay i'm gonna come back to you last year to get last words of wisdom here uh, before we end the show uh julie uh, before we go also and i took you off the screen here let's talk about this astro Wu finance we just recorded explain the concepts to the audience member here of how we're bridging together both the tarot and the astrology as we're looking into uh, personal finances here moving up for the month of october yeah, so every month uh, we do a general read of all the energies in astrology for the month to come. So we did October and it, it's a big month, astrologically speaking, with uh, this eclipse season that's starting and the Saturn Uranus square and all the shifts in the financial world. So I think it's a great month if you want some more guidance. And also we go through all the 12 signs, so more personal uh, predictions and guidance for your sign and your rising sign. Janine uh, does the tarot cards for the energies and I go through uh, the birth charts. So okay. it's a great combo. Very good. So guys, you can find that at beyondmystic.net forward slash pay-per-view. If you scroll down there, you can do a pay-per-view episode by episode a la carte, so to speak, to give it a try. And if you like the content there, you can also consider uh, using the Insider Access Pass, which will give you uh, front row seating and priority access to all of this amazing uncensored content. And a big thank you to all of you Insider Access Pass members who make it possible for us to still be out here, uh, even though YouTube is demonetizing our channels and giving us and treating us like children, as Jay says. Uh, Jay, last words of wisdom here like i know um, you've said this many times before and uh, i'm just going to come on and say it a lot of people have issue with what we're describing here today because they fall into that fear frequency and you've been um, repeating that many times that no that's the enemy here we need to drop out of that fear frequency and get into that self-responsibility but for that knowledge is key Explain to the audience members how they can prepare and take their own control of their lives here as all of these other systems around us are crumbling by necessity of the changes of universe here. We are moving into the age of Aquarius. How would you help them guide uh, through this transition? Well, uh, first off, uh, there is no such thing as scarcity. So well, you got to get that out of your head. I have... Um, uh, about 27 uh, quarts of sauerkraut that I made. Uh, I think it cost me 36 cents, I think, in seeds. Um, mm -hmm. I have uh, 300 quarts of tomato sauce. I think that cost me a le less than a dollar. Um, so I don't, I, I don't, I don't go in for the scarcity stuff anymore. I think that it's a matter of, of application. And so I th think if you think about your surroundings, think about the people that you know, then you can find a way to make your life very, very um, abundant and, uh, and, and freedom. And you, and you'll have, you have your freedom and we can't, we can't fall for their, their line about how everything's going away and it's not going away. It's just changing. And it's in some ways, I think changing for the better. Because if we're growing our own food, they're not putting like glycosyl phosphate all over everything, um, and you know, and, and, and the water systems will be better, and you know, it, it's just going to be a much better world. Uh, so I'm just asking everyone to not let the Pisceans scare the crap out of you, because that's what they're trying to do right now. Right. I love it. That's great advice. Jay, hold the line here. I'm going to sign off, but I want to talk to you about scheduling maybe another show after this. So just hold on. Don't don't hang up. Guys, if you love this content, thank you so much, first of all, for uh, joining us here today. Uh, please remember to like, share, and subscribe here to uh, the Backup channel. And stay tuned also next week. Uh, Julie will be back with her lovely sister, Sophie, who does tarot. And we do a lot of these mainstream media news decodes using tarot and astrology together. So that's the Divine Feminine Oracle show uh, on Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock Eastern. Tonight's show, The Wacky Woo, is uh, canceled. Joe is in Florida and dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Ian. So just after this show here, I'll go ahead and uh, change those posters so take note of that so thank you so much everyone for joining this was nostradamus and the vortex of time with mr jay widener you can find him at reality check here on youtube and also with julie you can find her at maisonjupiter.com i love you guys have a great day and we'll see you soon
Au revoir. Au revoir.